Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And I've got an amazing guest for you today. I want to introduce you to Selena Caesar Chavanez. She is an equity and inclusion advocate and a leadership consultant. She was the former member of parliament who served as a parliamentary secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and to the Minister of International Development. During her political career, Selena advocated for people suffering with mental illness and was given the Champion of Mental Health Parliamentarian Award in May 2017 by the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health. That year, she was also named one of the Global 100 Under 40 Most Influential People of African Descent from within the politics, politics and governance category. After she stepped away from the Liberal Party to sit as an independent member in 2019, Selena was picked as one of Chatelaine Magazine's Women of the Year. Before entering politics, she was a successful entrepreneur, launching and growing an award-winning research management consulting firm with a particular focus on neurological conditions. So Selena, welcome to Imperfect. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I have so many questions and I'm so <laughs> excited to have you here. And we were talking before we hit uh, record because one of my daughters saw you speak at a conference three years ago and you've left such a lasting impression. So as a mom, thank you for your leadership and your mentorship to all young girls out there. Oh, thank you so much. They are, I have two daughters, myself and a son, and they are my inspiration. So through proxy, um, they, all young people really inspire me to keep going and doing better. So thank you to, to you for raising such a phenomenal young woman, but also to her for, for the acknowledgement. I appreciate it. Well, I'm very excited to interview you. So I'm going to dive right in and ask you four leadership questions. And my first leadership question, I'm a big lover of neuroscience. It's my background. And I know that you were a successful entrepreneur within management consulting, and you had a particular focus on neurological conditions. So my question is, how did you get the vision and the passion to take you from that to launch into politics? Yeah, you know what? I, I love the brain. I think the brain is the final frontier of human discovery. And it really is a sexy organ, <laughs> if you can say that on a podcast. But for me, you know, I was running clinical trials uh, related to dementia, related to epilepsy. And one of the, the research projects that I was working on before getting into politics was a national epidemiology study on neurological conditions, looking at scope, health services, risk factors um, at, for 14 priority conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ep epilepsy, MS, um, across the age continuum. And one of the things that I was noticing or that we heard from individuals who were part of this of this study was, you know, the the challenges they had as as families, you know, moving from one province to another in order to get a drug cover that wasn't covered from one provincial formulary. So you had to move to another province to get medications covered or couples who had to divorce in order to get services. And I really thought, you know, there has to be an intersection of being able to ensure that the policy protects those people and ultimately protects the most vulnerable among us. And it was one of the critical decisions or factors in influencing my decision to enter into politics. 
Well, and that makes total sense. And I, when I was doing my, my homework and researching you, it's funny because that's one of my favorite words, intersection. I thought, where was the intersection for her? And, and now I can see where your, your passion and your vision really came to fruition because that's where you make a difference is in policy. So what a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's, it's important to, for me, the, the why I got into politics is people and especially the most vulnerable of us in our communities. Well, I always love saying on this podcast that it really doesn't matter what sector we're in. We're all in the people business, right? (laughs) hundred percent. So my second question, all of my guests since the inception of the podcast last May have got this question, share with us what imperfections you bring to your heart-centered leadership? Oh my goodness, such a great question. So um, I would say all of my, all of them, all of the mistakes that I've made, all of the flaws, all of the hurts, all of the pains, um, I bring all of those things forward into heart-centered leadership. And the, the reason why I say that is because all of those those pains and hurts have allowed me to have the empathy that is required of heart-centered leaders. I think that understanding that people have those challenges, that they have those moments where they fail and they feel guilty or they feel shame, understanding that, you know, we have more in common, including our mistakes, than we have differences among us it creates that empathy that allows us as human beings and especially as individuals who are transformative leaders or heart-centered leaders to be able to connect with other people in a way that allows them to move forward for the greater good. If we've learned nothing in 2020, it really is that we're all in this together and we have to move forward together and empathy has to be at the center of that. Well, and I I love the word imperfection. I loved it so much. I made it the title of this podcast, but you brought up a really good point there. And I think embracing the imperfection of our own character flaws, it belongs on the side of imperfection, but it also allows us the opportunity to have it combined with empathy to really possess as qualities to lead as a heart-centered leader. So such a good way to frame that. I haven't had anybody do it that way. So it's always intriguing to see how my guests answer this question and it makes it fun for me to ask it. (laughs) Thank you. Now, February is going to be super special for you. And I'm not talking about Valentine's Day. You, You got a new book coming out called Can You Hear Me Now? How I Found My Voice and Learned to Live with Passion and Purpose. So I just want to dig deep into why you wanted to write a book. And if you would share some thoughts around the theme of the book, having a certain strength to really portray and share with us your mistakes, your vulnerabilities, just everything we talk about on this podcast. Take us back to that moment and then give us a little trajectory of how you're feeling now, knowing it's weeks away from hitting the bookstores. So... (laughs) Deb, this is this is great because it's no longer a week. So I'll answer this question, these questions in reverse order. It's no longer a week, it's days. We're five days away from it hitting the bookstores. And, and in fact, people have already received the book. Um, so there is some trepidation with knowing that people are going to be opening the pages and reading in black and white, not only the words that I've written, but um touching a little bit on our previous question and the themes that are in the book, just understanding that people are gonna be reading about some of these mistakes I made. I was intentional, Deb, about really uh, leveraging the word that you have in in your podcast, really highlighting my imperfections, highlighting the mistakes that I've made, 
and the pains that I went through and being really vulnerable with the book in a way that I don't think a lot of memoirs are. I find that, you know, sometimes there are memoirs where they highlight all of like the, the successes people had and, you know, the great things that they've done. This has some of that in there, but it also shows every single mistake and what, ones that I'm ashamed of and embarrassed of as well. And the reason that I put those in as, as a theme of the book is exactly for, for you know, to, to put that imperfection on display because it helped to, to build that empathy. It helped to, to in, for me in writing the book, to really let go of a lot of those hurts. But also I think that when we are very candid with our vulnerability, it builds resilience in other people. When we are able to remove the facade, um, step away from you know, the Instagram filtered lives that we live and actually show ourselves as true human beings, that's when we really start to connect those fibers that may have been lost. We, we saw a lot of that with the inter insurrection of, you know, the Capitol in, in, in January and, you know, all of the sort of divisiveness that the world has. I think removing some of that allows us to connect as human beings through our vulnerability, through our realness. And I wanted to write it just for that, for the purposes of saying, let's just, let's just peel it back a little. Let's just go back to basics and realize that we really are more in, in, we have more in common than we have that are different. And that includes our capacity to make mistakes, to have flaws, but to also have joys and to have triumphs as well. Well, I like to call mistakes fall forwards. And <laughs> I love it because, you know, you've been described as a breaker of boundaries for black women in business you chose to make the decision to get into politics because you wanted to make a bigger difference in the world. And you also were the first black person elected to represent the federal riding of Whitby, Ontario. So just know there's a big virtual high five coming to you <laughs> through this mic. And what I love the most is you own your character flaws. You yes. own them. You have the ability to fail forward. But then what I love is you're a strategist and you get back up and go, follow me, let me show you the way. And maybe I can mentor and lead you with heart centered quality. So you won't do what I do. Oh. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that is, you know, I, I realized that moment and I talk about it in my book where I'm, I'm sitting at this, at this table and someone asks me, you know, do I regret anything that I've done in my life? And I say, no, you know, and it's the first time that I'm able to articulate that my mistakes that I've held as a burden, that I've held as shame, that I've held as, as you know, this, this reason for me to feel guilty actually created the person that was sitting at that table, you know, um, advocating for other people and, and doing the stuff that I'm able to do. So it really is the fall forward. And the challenge is understanding that the mistake can be the fall forward if you take the time to learn from it. 100%. You fall forward. You know, it's that old cliche I used to hear my Irish Nana say, Things and people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lesson. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Pick a lane and, and learn from it and don't sit and wallow. Oh, I love this. <laughs> okay, my last leadership question, and this is going out to so many people, and you're the best person to answer this. Share with us the most challenging aspect of working in a diverse environment from your vantage point. Oh, wow. I would say the challenge of diversity, if I could, if I could change the word a little bit, the challenge of working in a, diver, in a diverse environment is the fact that I don't think people leverage that diversity. You know, when we look at to our, our schools, our shopping centers, our communities, our workplaces, there are diverse people of different backgrounds, sexual orientations, um, religious backgrounds, et cetera. 
what I think we fail to do oftentimes is make those spaces inclusive and making them inclusive is, is striving towards equity within those spaces. Diversity in and of itself or a diverse space where you have all of these different people sort of walking or working in silos doesn't really add strength to your organization or to what your communities or to your schools. It's when we have those connections is when we put, put away the, the sort of the filters and the falsehoods and we just connect as human beings where we're able to have those inclusive sort of conversations. We're able to understand each other more. We're able to attain that level of empathy for each other that we could only get when we're listening and understanding each other. That's when we strive towards equity. So for me, diverse organizations are only a tool that can be used to get to the point where we get to a more equitable uh, outcome and to a more just society. Well, and I know you're further pursuing this uh, academically yourself, and, and I know you're working on your PhD, and, and you're going to focus on organizational leadership and I can't wait to stay in touch and carry on more conversations and I'll be excited to hear what you're doing your dissertation in. so I, I, we're going to be having a part two to this conversation for sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to switch to my fab four now and okay. just four fun questions. We want to know what's on the top of, of your mind. First question, tell us something that we don't know about Selena. Oh my goodness, what people don't know, which I think that they would assume is not the case, is that I am a what I call a trained extrovert. I am such an introvert. I would much rather be in my pajamas, under my covers, in my bed, like not around anybody, <laughs> just self-isolated to the nth degree. Um, I, I, I just, I love being by myself. I love being with my own thoughts, reading, journaling, doing that sort of thing. But people see me sort of externally and think that I'm just this total extrovert, which I am absolutely not. Well, I, I'm in the same lane. They think because you're outgoing and you're a coach or you were in public office or you write a book or you do a podcast. I am also a trained extrovert and I'm right there with you with the fuzzy slippers and a good book. Yeah. <laughs> and what's super interesting is almost all of the leaders that I have interviewed on the podcast since last May, we all have that in common. All thought leaders are truly introverts. And I think it's because we, we think it's such a deep level of thought that we really need that cognitive break and not that social stimulation Right. And it just, it intrigues me because I hear this over and over so much. And I thought, oh, I've got a whole new group of friends out there that I didn't even <laughs> know. And we're all in the introvert club, but people think like you talked about because we're out there talking and chatting and leading and mentoring, it's just a perception, isn't it? It, it really is. And even when I'm at parties or social events, I'm in the corner sipping my wine and just watching people move and how they communicate and what they do. So I'm usually off to the side and just, just enjoying like the present sometimes, just taking that moment to just enjoy the moments that are happening as opposed to the busyness of what is happening in the moment. Well, I'm a yoga teacher, so you're going to get another high five for that. <laughs> I always say to people, if we could have a cognitive address of living in the now, yeah. our, our world would be so different. Our oh. thought process, our leadership, so fun. Okay, second question, who is a leader who has really inspired you? And would you share with us why? Okay, so this answer is going to be unconventional because I have two. And as um, you may know, I have three children, but my daughters, <laughs> they are 100% my, my heroes, the, the, the individuals that I look up to. They are like Selena 2.0, I call them. 
Um, my, my daughter, Desiree, she's, you know, finished her law degree, world traveler, lived on her own since she was, God only knows, 17, I guess, and has just really did everything at, in her life that when I was growing up, I was too afraid to do. And then my daughter, Candace, who's 16, also really well traveled, travels by herself, um, you know, goes on these amazing adventures and is so incredibly smart, has a tongue like acid, reminds me so much of myself. But again, it's just, it's just, are just these unafraid, uninhibited people who are advocates for social justice. They stand up for um, people with um, different and multiple intersecting identities. I just, I just couldn't be more inspired and at the same, same time more proud of, uh, of, of two individuals that, that keep me motivated to do, to keep doing good and, and hoping that I'll, I'll make them proud enough. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because we were we were chatting before we recorded here. And I can honestly say I feel the same way about my daughters. You almost have a little bit of living vicariously through them. But you gotta you gotta give kudos back to being that mom of having a voice and stepping into leadership and like you said, dropping the facade and really demonstrating to your daughters or sons, it's okay to fail. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to cry. There's mm -hmm. no one emotion that we're to be in after a circumstance or a situation. So it's lovely that that's who inspires you and, and you've raised two leaders and I mean, look who their mama is. <laughs> I'm I'm really proud of of all three of my kids, but those two girls are just, oh, it, it, you know when I when you kind of look back and see what they've done over their lives, I'm like I'm I'm often nervous about it because I'm like what who is your mother and why did she let you do all this stuff and then I'm like oh I'm your mother and I let you do all this stuff. It's I always joke with my kids and say that they are a life sentence. <laughs> And they just smile back at me. Now, other than the obvious, which we're going to put out good wishes for your book, I am excited to get a copy for myself and my daughter from you. Of course, we want a well-wished signature in the front from you. For sure. Aside from the logistics and the business side of, of releasing a book, what is your wish for this book and the message that you're conveying? Oh, great question. Um, my wish is really to the young people who read, especially young women who read this book. Um, and, I, and I put a list of young women in the acknowledgements um, on purpose because I want them to know that their voice, their authenticity, their every experience, every joy, pain, strength, flaw, everything is adds value and is so important to our world. And I've done the whole, you know, I cracked myself open and exposed everything so that these young women can, can have, could know that they're not the, gonna be the only ones who make a mistake and won't feel alone if and when they do make a mistake but know that no matter what the challenge that faces them, they can overcome it. And I'm hoping that young women in particular read this book and are so inspired and feel like they have somebody who sees them and who is looking out for them. That's beautiful. And I, I, I can already feel from what you've written about the book and listening to the audio clip, I'm, I'm really excited to get the book to, to have for myself, but especially for my, my daughter who's in social justice and peace and has heard you speak. And it's, it always warms my heart as a mom and a professional when another woman can say something to really ground 
a young person's attention, but you've engraved a message on her heart. And I think your book is just going to further augment that. So I'm super excited for you. And what a beautiful wish and message that you've done for the world. My last question is, what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a similar career to yours? So a couple of things. Um, Number one, show up, go for it. I don't think that I could have achieved, you know, any level of success, however you define success. That's a, that's a topic for another podcast. Um, But I couldn't have achieved a level in which I'm using my voice and living with passion and purpose if I didn't show up in the first place. The second is to be authentic. Um, When you show up, be, be your authentic space, your authentic self in those spaces. As I said, bring everything, all of your experiences, um, education, experience, knowledge adds value and know that that value is a, a complement to whatever institution that you are in. And third, if you're going to show up and you're going to be authentic, use your voice. Do not for a moment think that your voice is is not powerful enough to change the world. Use your voice. And, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious about not saying that, you know, I'm a voice for the voiceless. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has the capacity to change the world. Oftentimes they are whispers and we need other people to help amplify those voices. So show up be authentic, use your voice for good and change the world. Well, and you made a really good point there. We've heard many voices over decades that have had a good message, a poor message and a message of indifference. Mm -hmm. They They all move the needle. Right. It's emotion. And it's, you know, my favorite neuroscience term, it's metacognition. It's how we choose to think about thinking for what we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears. Mm -hmm. So it's always interesting. It's not only the message, it's the delivery of the message and the intent. Is Mm -hmm. Is it emotionally feasible? Is it something that's going to really augment leadership? Or like you said, Is it just a facade? And I think people are getting better at seeing through the fog and and they're really being able to pull out who the leaders are. And I think that's been one of the gifts of COVID. Yes. Yes. Well, I know that you're a busy lady, so I'm delighted that I got to spend some time with you this afternoon on the podcast Uh, You got two big fans in my household here, and we're going to wait with bated breath for this book. Oh, thank you so much, Deb. This has been an absolute pleasure. And it was so great to reconnect with your little one again. It was so good. Oh, absolutely. And I, I just wish you nothing but continued success. I think you're just getting started. And I look forward to keeping in touch and continued conversations. And I'm going to end the podcast today with a leadership quote and it goes like this leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence Mm -hmm. so I want to thank Selena because I really think that quote is so representative of who she has been in her career the decision that she made to change careers and then the tenacity, the courage, the vulnerability to write her new book. So we'll make sure that we have all the details in the episode description so you can check out her book and connect with her online. And this is Deb Crow. Thank you once again for joining me on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast.